in jesus mighty name we have worship in jesus mighty name we have worship amen praise the lord please you may be seated hallelujah hallelujah what a day what a moment to be in god's presence to give him thanks for his marvelous kindness his generosity his love his blessings so many things to give god thanks for hallelujah for bringing us into a brand new year what a privilege to even stand in his presence i always say that it's a great great privilege to have audience with the king of the universe you know you just don't go into earthly kings you know you don't go into their presence anyhow you need an appointment you need some clearance and so many protocols before you can even have you know have access to them but god has granted us a free access he said come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain what mercy and find grace to help in times of need what a privilege hallelujah and we thank god for that amen this morning we have a very wonderful servant of god roger please come amen can we put us together for amen i, I, I want to thank god for the privilege to introduce uh god's servant this morning uh it's a great privilege for us to call him and his wife to friends it's a great great privilege for us they were here uh we had a program on friday saturday finishing well conference just looking at how what it means to finish well and they have been an awesome awesome blessing to us and few of our friends that were at that meeting amen uh roger how do i introduce him uh he's god's servant is god's slave he prefer that amen and that is true you can either be a slave to jesus or a slave to some other things hallelujah uh he and his wife they live in mount pleasant uh in texas they are beekeepers and uh, uh, they take care of plants also, fruit trees. Amen. They use it as a platform to reach out to others. Of course, he has been in the corporate world for so many years before he retired and uh, they surrendered themselves for God to use them to reach the world, the lost with the gospel. And that is what they've been doing. And then, of course, doing training and um, sharing their experience on what God has taught them on how to finish well. Uh, they've written a book, which is, I'm sure it'll be out very soon on finishing well. I'm sure uh, when we have some copies, some of you will have the privilege of going through them. So Roger is here to share with us today, and I believe that the Lord will use him to be a blessing to you. Can we give him a big God bless you as he... Pastor Julius, thank you so much for having us here. This must be a little bit of what heaven will be like, I think, yes? I felt a little bit like David dancing today. We don't dance in American churches. That's a sad thing. I wish we did, right? But we don't. I get to wear beautiful clothing, and we are blessed. Julius and Jamila have blessed us with clothing, and we are grateful for it as well. Thank you so much for doing that with us. Thank you. Our world is a mess. The currency has gone crazy here in Niger. Is that right? We have war and strife all around us. We have people that can't seem to get along. They can't agree on anything, let alone whether you like red stew or you want uh, jollof rice. They can't even agree on that, right? But yet we are called as 
God's people to live in the midst of this world. But how do we do that? How do we do that? In 1983, one of my mentors gave me a book. It was called, How Shall We Then Live? Written by Francis Schaeffer. I read the book a couple of years later. I didn't understand it. I didn't have any wisdom. But I had the question, how shall we then live? How shall I live as a businessman in this world? How shall I live as a husband in this world? If I'm a follower of Jesus, what does it look like to love my children? How am I to live in this world? Well, 40 years have passed since that time, but that question has still remained. And that's the question I want to talk about today. In the midst of all of the chaos here, whether it's in your country, Nigeria, or my country, around the world, it's the same. How do believers and followers of Jesus live in this world? So if you have your scriptures or your app, open up, if you would, to Philippians 2, and that's where we're going to go. Philippians chapter 2, if you're there. We're going to be in verses 5 and go to verse 18. The Word of God says this, Have this mind amongst yourself, which is in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being humble and born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Amen? In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, he says in verse 12, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but also in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Circle that if you would. That you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation amongst whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast to the world of life. So in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even as I am poured out as a drink offering, this is Paul now, upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice, rejoice with me. Let's look at it then. So what are the times that we live in now? What are they like? Look in verse 15. The believers in Philippi were in the midst of a crooked and perverse, a crooked and twisted generation. God understands that that was crooked and twisted then. He understands that it is that way now. God is not surprised by what's going on in our world. Amen? Maybe it's just a little more open right now. We can see it. Maybe the perversion. We can't even figure out if you're male or female in my country. It's a mess. Persecution is ramping up. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you are going to be a subject to persecution. We see this all around us now. Perversion is here and more is coming. How shall we then live? I think from the text we're going to see three things. First off, where is it we are now? Who are you and me in this world? And lastly, how are we then to live? Where are we? Who are we? How will we live? Look in Philippians 2.15, if you would. We live in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. This was true of Philippi, where Paul was. It was a city in northeast Macedonia, modern Greece, lots of trade, lots of gold mines, lots of money. In Philippi, it reflected all the paganism there was in Rome, idolatry everywhere, crooked and perverse place. But here is where the Apostle Paul and God chose to put a church on his second missionary journey, right in the middle of crookedness, perversion, and all that Rome had to offer. God's everywhere. Even though the Philippians were poor, the Philippians 
church was poor, Paul praised them. He said they were generous. They gave out of their poverty. When Paul planted that church, it was attacked by the, the Jews, their culture and false teachers. They said, Paul says this in Philippians 3, Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. Discord and disunity were in the church as well. Two ladies couldn't get together, Eudodia and Syntyche. And Paul says, please help them get along. Does that sound like our church today? Can you get along in the church? Maybe. I've seen churches split over the color of tile. It's awful. But here's what Paul says about that in Philippians 1, verse 28. He says, don't be alarmed by your opponents. Don't be alarmed by the opposition out there. For it has been granted for you, for Christ's sake, not only to those who believe in him, but it has been granted unto you to suffer. Isn't that an interesting thing to say? You are in the midst of this for a suffering. It's going to be a difficult time. Be ready for that, but it's okay. Paul says this in Philippians 2. He says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection, any compassion, make my joy. What I saw this morning was joy. Did you have joy in the Lord this morning? That's what Paul is saying. In the midst of all of this, he has joy. He says, make my joy complete by being the same mind, one intent and one purpose. Despite all that was going on in the world, Specifically in the Philippian church, Paul said that they should have joy. These are poor, harassed people in the midst of a wicked culture, and they are to be joyful. Well, is this new? Is it new what we're going through right now? Let's have a look. Jesus said the phrase, crooked and perverted nation. He said that in Matthew chapter 17 and to Luke chapter 9. He was talking to the Jews of his day. He said this. You are an unbelieving, perverted generation. The Greek word there is scolios. It means twisted. It's like where we get the word scoliosis of the spine. It's twisted. It means that they were not in line with the standard. They were bent and twisted. Solomon in Proverbs 2, verse 11, he says this is written about 950 B.C. He says, discretion will guard you. Understanding will watch over you to deliver you from the way of the evil, from those who delight in doing evil, rejoice in the and then rejoice in the perversity of evil, whose paths are crooked and devious. So in 950 B.C., in Jesus' day, in Paul's day, in our day, this world is crooked and perverted. Amen? We have crooked and perverted people all through our nation. So should we expect anything else from them than what we see in the world, unregenerate behavior? So this is where we are. We live in the midst of a twisted and perverted bunch of people. Do you work with them every day? Do you see them in the marketplace every day? Do they try to teach you every day? Yes, they do. Jesus said this to his followers in John 17. This is Jesus' high priestly prayer. He says this, Father, I, Jesus, do not ask you to take them, my disciples, out of the world. But I want you to keep them from the evil one. They are not of this world. We are not. As I am not of this world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I send them into the world. Did you notice what Jesus prayed for? He didn't pray that we would be taken out of the world. He didn't pray that the world would be any different. He asked the Father to protect us from the evil one and to sanctify us with the truth of his word. That's what Jesus' prayer was for you and me. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 5, 9. He says this, I wrote to you a letter not to associate with immoral people, Paul says, but I didn't mean the immoral people of the world or the covetous, or the swindlers, or the idolaters. For then you would have to go out of the world. Beloved, 
Do not go to a monastery. Do not go to a nunnery. Do not go anywhere out of the world. Stay exactly where you are. So where should we be? God expects us to be right in the midst, right where we are. He calls us right where you are, right where I am, to be lights in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation. Now, God has put some restraints in our world. He's given the word of God. It's in people's hearts. They have a conscience. The family is there. It has authorities to raise children. We also have the church, which is where we can learn and grow. But the church has fallen on hard times. Many churches in my country want to be more accepting of those who are unbelievers. And so they water down the gospel of Jesus. And lastly, we have the police or the police security forces, but they've been under attack too. All of these institutions that God has put in place are under attack, and God is removing his hand of protection from this world. Read about that in Romans 1. The bottom line, folks, is that we live in a world that cannot be fixed. This side of heaven, it will not be fixed. Ecclesiastes 1.1, the wisest man in the world, King Solomon, the richest man, he said this, it is all vanity. It is all nothingless. It's vapor-like. That is life. You are going to die. You cannot fix the fallen world. The quest for justice, that's vanity too. There will not be justice this side of Jesus coming again. There's no perfect justice on the earth. But God will bring every deed into judgment, good or evil, but that's not where we live now. Is there justice in our world now? No, absolutely not. Man against man, woman against woman, it's not there. So let's talk about who we are. We live in the midst of a crooked and perverted generation, and that is exactly where God wants us to be. And he knows it. It's no surprise. He has prayed for us to be protected from the evil one. That's where we are. But who are we then? Let's see who that is. We are not the children of the devil. Philippians 2.15, we are to be children of God above reproach, lights in the world. We are his children, and we are lights. That's who we're to be. We understand the devil's kingdom, devil's children, behave like their father. Jesus said this in John 8. He says to the Jews, you do the deeds of your father, they said to him, we're not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said, no, no. If God were your father, you would love me. For I have come from him, and I have come, and I will go back to God. I didn't even come on my own. God sent me here to be with you. Why do you not understand what I'm saying to you? Is it because you cannot hear my word? You are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. Your father was a murderer from the beginning, and he is a liar. He does not stand in the truth. Whatever he speaks, he lies, because he speaks from his own nature, speaking of Satan. He is a liar, the father of lies. But I speak the truth, Jesus said, but you do not believe me. If one thing is characteristic of our world, then... It is that they are killers and liars. Is that not true? Our daughter lives in Plateau State in Joss. She's a missionary there. So when the attacks of Christmas around that time came, my WhatsApp, my emails lit up from her supporters in the U.S. asking, how are things there? There are liars and killers everywhere, are they not? We are the children of God. There's a very clear separation between the children of God and the children of Satan. Because we're children of God, you hear his word. You follow his word. You obey his word. John 1, 12, do you know it? Now, as many as received him, Christ, he said, he gave them the right to become what? Children of God, even to those who believe his name. We, beloved, are children of God. And we live in the midst of the children of the devil. That's who we are. By this you will know, 1 John 3.10, by this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who doesn't practice righteousness is not of God, 
nor the one who doesn't love his brother. Where you see a lack of love and habitual unrepentant sin, you see a child of the devil. Children of the devil have overseen things in government since the beginning. Nothing's changed. So we, the children of God, are exactly where God wants us to be in the midst of a crooked and perverted generation. Are you okay with that? All right. We're to be lights of the world, too. We are God's children and we're lights. The word here, the Greek word is phoster. It means lights that reflect. It's like the sun, the moon, and the stars. They produce light and they reflect the light. That's who we are. Paul says we're to be amongst those, amongst those, the children of the world, whom you appear as lights. We are to be different. The scriptures, the word of God, and God's children are the only lights in the darkness. That's all there is. We're it. He chooses to use you and me and the Word of God to bring light to this world in a dark place. Does that make sense? Maybe you're in a dark place. The corporate world where I spent many years was a dark place. Where we live now is a dark place, but we're called to be lights there, just as you are. We are luminaries. We are exactly where we need to be in the midst of darkness in this crooked and perverse world. It's where he wants us to be. He doesn't take us out of the world. He wants us to be protected from the evil one. So we know where we are. We know what we are. We are God's children. We are lights. So how do we then live? What do we do? First, let's establish another fact here. If you have your Bibles, turn over to John 18 for a second. We live in a universe parallel universe, a parallel world, a parallel realm that the world, unbelieving world does not understand, does not connect with, does not relate to. They can't see it because they're dead in their trespasses and sin. We are alive to God. We live in a completely different world than the children of the devil. Listen to Jesus about this. This is John 18:37. Jesus has been on trial. He's now before Pilate. Pilate, Pilate asks him a sar sarcastic question. He says, so, Jesus, you are a king then. And Jesus said, you are correct that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone is, who is of the truth hears my voice. Does that sound like John 10? The sheep hear his voice. But go back in verse 36 for a second. Jesus says this to Pilate. My kingdom is not of this world. The Jews tried to make him a king. You may remember that in John 6. He didn't allow it. Listen very carefully here. Jesus' kingdom has no connection with the kingdoms of this world. No connection. The whole world lies in the lap of the evil one, Satan. We have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear Son. Amen? This kingdom that belongs to Christ transcends the world. It doesn't derive its power from the world, nor its success, reality, origin, nature, extent. None of that comes from this world. No created thing. Christ's kingdom comes from God and God alone. Christ's kingdom will triumph over the whole creation of kingdoms. Revelation 11 says this, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord. Maybe if you know Handel's Messiah, you know that. And his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. That is what's coming, beloved. He will halt the existence of all other kings, all other kingdoms. And he will rule as king of kings. Do you look forward to that day? Do you wish that day came today? Would that be amen? Uh, me too. I'm right there. But right now, we still live in this world here. But one day, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 21 tells us that. And God will reign sovereignly forever. But for now, the kingdom of God is not yet. It's not yet in its eternal form. Do you know that this planet will be destroyed? It was that we live on a disposable planet. And yet we spend a lot of time gathering stuff on this planet, don't we? We're going to live in a new heaven and a new earth. It's a spiritual kingdom. 
spiritual reality above and beyond all earthly powers. Nothing, no person, no person's powers on earth have any effect on Christ's kingdom. It doesn't matter who's in power in the government. It doesn't matter what their connections are. God rules alone. If we change out the leadership of government, we simply change one sinning person for another one until they are regenerate. It doesn't matter. For now, the kingdom of God is in the hearts of those who believe, in your heart and mine if you're a follower of Jesus. He's our king, and the church is where his kingdom becomes visible. Is that right? You get to see it here. The singing and the languages, this is what heaven is going to be like. There's going to be a few hundred more languages out there, but that was fantastic. What a great way to celebrate. Amen? All right. So given that truth, here we are. How should we live? Let's go back and review. We live in a twisted, twisted and perverted world. We are exactly where God wants us to be. We are God's children. We are his lights. We are exactly who he's redeemed us to be. We live in a parallel universe, a spiritual kingdom that the world doesn't see or understand. Sometimes you make decisions and people will think you are crazy because you are following Jesus and not following the world. Amen? All right, let's go back to Philippians here. Let's go back to verse 5, Philippians 2, 5. We're going to look at some commands now of how we live. Here's what God tells us. Here's how we live in the midst of this perverse generation. So the first command is in Philippians 2.5 itself. He says this, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself. We, brothers and sisters, are to live in humility. We're to have the same attitude that our Lord Jesus had when he emptied himself and took on the form of a slave. And then he became humbled. As he humbled himself, God exalted him. So if you are humbled, know that God will exalt. It's likely that all of us are going to be humbled before we die. We will be shamed. But this is a good thing, because whoever is humbled, God exalts. Jesus humbled himself. And by that, he was highly exalted. He accomplished God's glorious purpose of salvation. He died on the cross for us. And we will also be exalted. We are to live in the midst of this perverse and twisted generation. We're to be humble. Second, look is down in Philippians 2.12. You are to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What does that mean? Well, this means that we have this process of coming to Christ. Sanctification, it's called. The process of mature, maturation, becoming a full believer, becoming a true believer, becoming one who is mature in Christ. Hebrews 5.12 says it this way, Solid food is for the mature who've had their senses trained to discern good and evil. Paul says that he pursues holiness in Philippians 3, Christ-likeness. God is for us. Philippians 2.13, he says this, It is God who it works in you, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. God wants you to be mature. God desires that you be holy. God desires that you be humble. So how do we live in this world? We live humbly, and we live mature, holy lives as believers. Go on to the third command. Go down to verse 16. The English Standard Version says that they're to hold fast to the word, hold forth to the word. That means they go out and they evangelize. They share the word of God. Do you do that with others? Do you share the word of God? That's where we're to be. That is the only source of truth. Frankly, everything else is fake news. We have one source of truth in the scriptures. Does it sound like the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, 20, where whereas Jesus said we're to go out and to make disciples and to teach them to observe all that I commanded you? And lo, I am with you always until the end of the age. That's what we're to be doing. That's what we're still here. Have you ever wondered why God didn't take you home at salvation? It's because you and I still have work here to do, and we are to be God's witnesses and God's light in a crooked and perverse world. Amen? Fourth command is down in Philippians 2.18. We are to rejoice in the same way. Paul means he rejoiced in his suffering. 
I rejoiced in my sacrifice. Paul says literally there, in my sacrifice I found joy. I rejoice in sacrifice I'm making to you. And I urge you, brethren, rejoice in the same way. You and I are going to make sacrifices in this world. We're going to be cheated. We're going to have things bad said about us. We will sacrifice reputation. We will sacrifice physical things that we have. And in that, he says, we are to have joy. That's hard, beloved, but that's the word of God. Have joy in our suffering. Have joy in our sacrifices. So we are to live humbly, maturely, proclaiming the gospel, and joyful. But there's one more command, and it's probably the most important of these. And when I first heard and thought about this, I thought that's the answer here. Fifth and final is down in Philippians 2.14. Paul says it this way. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Very practical. Bottom line, stop complaining. This is how you and I prove that we are blameless, innocent children of God, not above, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. We are to be lights. Stop complaining. It's easy for everyone to complain about the government, complain about the weather, complain, whatever it is. Stop complaining. Yes, be holy. Yes, be humble. Testify to the scriptures. Be joyful. But the priority here is to stop complaining. Well, Roger, are you talking about the government? No, not just the government. Stop complaining totally. Stop to complaining to God about the situation. You are who you are. You are where you are. And we are not to complain. This is what God has for us. Don't argue with him over his will. Don't argue with God over his purposes. Let's look at some complainers in the scripture, if you don't believe me on this one here. First major complainer in the scriptures was... Moses. Moses tries to convince God. Exodus 5, he says, you've got the wrong man, God. I can't talk. I can't speak. Wait, you're talking to the God of the universe, Moses, who chose you, who made you. And you're saying he got the wrong guy? Really? Exodus, what did the children of Israel do? They complained, beginning to end, without end. Why did you lead us here? Why are we in the wilderness? We don't like the food. There's no jollof rice here. There's no water. Well, the jollof rice is not, probably not in the scriptures, okay? But even the po people closest to Moses, Miriam, Aaron, they were complaining. So Miriam was struck with leprosy. Bottom line, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 10, these things happen to them as examples for us. So now we know what God thinks of complaining. Stop. Simply stop. God is our protector. Stop grumbling. Stop complaining. Stop questioning the will of God. It doesn't end well. You end up in a bad place. I end up in a bad place when I start complaining. If I complain about my government, who put that government in place? God did. Read Romans 13. There is no government. There is no leader that God did not put in that position. Even the bad ones. Even the Manassas of the world. God is our protector. We are to be humble. We are to be mature. We are to proclaim the gospel. We are to have joy. We are to have trust in God. Turn now, if you would. I want to close with a couple of encouraging words in Psalm 37. David says this, Do not fret. Don't worry. Don't be concerned about evildoers. Don't be envious of the wrongdoers. What about him? What about her? For they will wither like the grass and fade away like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land. Cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself. Many of us have memorized that. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do it. Cease from anger, forsake wrath. Beloved, wrath is for God. Revenge is for the Lord. He says, that is mine. Don't go there. Don't fret. It leads only to evil doing. Evildoers will be cut off. 
God sees, nothing escapes God. Okay? I have to trust in that. But those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Yet a little while and the wicked man will be no more. You will look in his place and you will not find him, it says. But the humble will inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. Look at this now from Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Peter says it this way. Do not let this fact escape you, beloved, that one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness. He is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Beloved, the Lord cannot come and make things right until he has gathered all of those who were destined to believe from the beginning of time. All of the believers must be gathered in, and then Jesus can come. This is 2 Peter 3.10 to 14. He says, The day of the Lord will come, and it will be like what? A thief in the night. And the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements, I'm a chemical engineer, the elements even will be destroyed in the heat. The earth and all of its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, even Peter asked, what sort of people should we be? We're to be holy in conduct and godliness. We look for and hasten the coming the day of our Lord. Look for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Beloved, don't complain against God. Everything's on schedule. The world is not falling to pieces. The pieces are just falling into place of God's plan. We're to live humbly, be mature, proclaim the word of God, live in joy, and trust God. Leave to God what is God's and do what he has assigned us to do. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word that brings clarity and truth to us. Thank you, Father, that you, even your son has prayed that you would protect us and you do protect us from the evil one. There is evil all around us. And Father, some of us in that, in the persecution that come, will die. You will bring us home to you. Death is simply a mode of transportation from this life to the next. And Father, we look forward to spending eternity with you. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Thank you, Father, for all of the wisdom that you have given to us in Philippians 2 on how we are to live lives. And Lord, thank you for making us and calling us out to be your children to be your lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And we are grateful. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Pastor Julius. All right.